Throughout history, supernatural creatures were thought to have run rampant in almost every part of the world. Whether you consider them to be dark superstitions, or figments of the overactive imagination, there was a time where stumbling across a goblin or a fairy in the midst of the woods was not such an unexpected thing, but rather the opposite. Many would have taken precautions against such creatures and spirits, given that there was a time when the world and all its mysteries were still largely unknown. Dismissing such fantastical beings was easier said than done. Whilst it is easy for us to regard these creatures as fictional, there are those who even today would argue in favour of these creatures being real, and that magic, in every sense of the word, is possible. This is perhaps even more true for the more human-like creatures that we've seen sprinkled here and there in various mythologies and folklore. Instead of dying out as society progressed, many of these creatures have flourished, not necessarily in the real world, but at least in the works of fiction and the stories we tell each other today. A great example of supernatural creatures surviving the ages are of course the elves. Elves have been a part of many different traditions and cultures, where they play a various set of different roles, from possessing magical powers and divine beauty, to being villainous and ugly. Many have seen the concept of elves from a very young age, some even immersed in it to the point that elves were not just a concept, but in actuality, a real race. Modern Christmas traditions of course determine that elves work throughout the year in Santa's workshop, somewhere in the North Pole, where they make toys for children who have been well behaved as well as serving their jolly red and white overlord with whatever he wants. For many modern children, elves are innocent, happy creatures that work in utter obedience for Father Christmas. As adults of course, we recognise this as a glorified sweatshop, and Santa is a tax evading, home invading, trespassing little slave driver. Interestingly, there was a point in time where he himself was considered to be an elf as well. Elves have also permeated modern fiction, fantasy fiction in particular, and many will of course look to Tolkien, who you might say revolutionised how we would come to look at elves. It was the elves in Middle-earth in Tolkien's work who would come to play a central role in his stories, and these elves that were so vividly carved into his craft would come to shape the way elves would be portrayed in many works today, from novels, movies, and even video games. Elves have since become staples in many high fantasy works, and you'd be hard pressed to find someone who didn't know what an elf was. But where did these ethereal creatures emerge from, and how did they come to achieve a mainstay presence in both literature and the modern world? Elves can be traced back as far as Norse mythology, as well as into Old English and Germanic folklore. The word elf appears to be rooted in the Anglo-Saxon language, where it was pronounced more along the lines of Eilf, before becoming Elf in the Middle English period. Eilf, or the compounded Eilfodl, would also mean Nightmare, suggesting the darker, more insidious side of Elves that we'll come to talk about later. Along with this, the term Elfen was also used by the Anglo-Saxons, a name given to the elves of the female variety. By the Middle English period though, this would be dropped, and there would be no distinction between the two, as the word elf came to represent both male and female. The word oaf in English may also have been a variant for the word elf, perhaps referring to a creature that could change its form, or to a person who'd been manipulated by an elf's enchantment. In the Old Norse language, meanwhile, the elf was once known as Alfir, or the pluralised form Alfar. Meanwhile, in Old High German, the elf would be known as Alp, or the pluralised Alpi. There was also the Elbi, which was the female variant. It wasn't uncommon for elves to even influence names in many Old English communities. Names such as Elfwine, meaning Elf Friend, or Elf Weird, meaning Elf Guardian, were not uncommon for the time period, and clearly the association with elves was seen as a good thing. 
good enough that people would name themselves after them in some way. Some of these names have even survived in modern English, including the name Alfred, once known as Elfred, meaning elf advice, or the name Elgar, once known as Elfgar, meaning elf spear. This would suggest that in a time where most supernatural beings could be considered sinister or paganistic, the elves were mostly regarded as benign, and were even honoured in society. Places within England are even named after elves, including Eldon Hill in the Peak District, or Elves Hill as it is known, as well as the Alden Valley in Lancashire, otherwise known as the Elves Valley. Where such places earn their names is not completely known, but there is an implication here that people once believed that elves gathered in these areas, and thus, elves would come to earn a reputation of congregating in woodlands and valleys. In English legends, elves were first thought of as innocent and beautiful creatures, those that possessed magical powers, and were sung of highly in ballads across the British regions. Many of these tales involved the mystical land of Elfame, or Elfland, a realm that travellers and wanderers were said to be whisked away to by fairies or other means of supernatural interactions. Of these accounts, various legends speak of Elfame being a pleasant place, a literal land of elves who are ruled by a beautiful fairy queen. Such accounts, such as the one by 13th century Scottish poet and supposed prophet Thomas the Rhymer, tell us that Elfland was a place like no other, and that the elf queen who ruled there had invited him, whereby he was given the gift of prophecy and the boon that he would never be able to tell a lie. Thomas suggests that there was something of a romance between him and the elf queen, and that she opened his eyes to the mysteries of the world, including showing him the path to heaven and hell. Other accounts of elves and the elf queen, however, become more sinister, particularly in witchcraft trials that took place in the early 16th century. A supposed witch by the name of Andro Mann told authorities upon being accused that he'd been abducted by the elf queen and that he'd had carnal relations with her. He also inferred that the elf queen was either the devil in disguise or that she served the devil in some capacity, given that her and her elven accomplices rode white horses through the forest under the watchful eye of Satan. Andrew Mann also confessed that the elf queen had taught him the ability to heal wounds and that she was something of a shapeshifter, maintaining the ability to change her form into anything. More common English folktales portray elves as small secretive beings that possess a more mischievous personality, similar to that of goblins. Whilst they are not evil, they do seek to agitate humans and interfere with their affairs with the intention of annoying them. To many of the time, elves were invisible and often responsible for the misplacing of items within the house and for the disappearance of possessions. On the contrary, Elves have also been considered to be dangerous creatures, as we've seen with the Elf Queen, but it's possible that these ideas bled in from Christianity, which sought to paint elves as a paganistic belief, and one that was certainly not congruent with God. Therefore, elves would also take the form of wicked and ugly beings that stalked unsuspecting travellers and sought to harm them. To some, elves became as threatening as demons, and could have been responsible for the murder of both humans and livestock. Meanwhile, in Scandinavia and the legends of Norse, stories of elves are ample. In many Icelandic works, elves were described in a divine sense and were commonly associated with fertility, good fortune and luck. Elves were thought in these stories to exist outside the laws of physics, implying that they had the ability to fly and could pass through solid matter, amongst other things. Legendary sagas, such as the 13th century Cormac saga, detail that warriors would make sacrifices to the elves, and that in exchange, the elves would heal grievous wounds, and even return the dead to life. 
However, despite how mystical and otherworldly these creatures appear to be, Norse mythology indicates that it was possible to marry and even father children with them. The offspring resulted in being a hybrid between human and elf. There is also an idea that those born of a human male and an elven female tended to be much more physically attractive than a person born from two regular humans. Many elven stories were once defined by the 12th century Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson, who once penned the Prose Edda, or the Younger Edda, a work considered by many to be the most comprehensive source of Norse mythology. In this work, Sturluson described elves in a lot more detail than in English legends, going on to assign them into various classes, including the Dark Elves and the Light Elves. Whilst it is mostly agreed that these were in some reference to angels and demons, and that these categorizations were Sturluson's own take on Christianity, it was once believed that there were two distinctions between elves. The Light Elves were thought to live in Elfheim, the home of the Light Elves, whilst the Dark Elves lived underground. As you might imagine, the Light Elves were beautiful creatures, and were thought of as guardians or even guardian angels, a trope you might say that Sturluson had borrowed from Christian influence. These light elves were also considered to be minor gods, and existed to oversee nature and fertility, as well as helping humans with their mystical powers. While they were also mischievous, they did often present themselves to humans in an effort to inspire them to create music and art. On the whole, the Light Elves were the more wholesome of creatures, and their presence was usually welcomed. The Dark Elves, on the other hand, were, as you might imagine, the more sinister. The Dark Elves loathed the sunlight, hence why they lived underground, and seemed to only appear on the surface during the nocturnal hours. If they were exposed to sunlight, they would immediately turn to stone. As a result of this, they hated the humans who could exist on the surface without hindrance, and so, they sought to threaten or terrorise the ones that either found themselves underground, or who happened to be unlucky enough to be caught out at night. Another belief was that the Dark Elves were able to infiltrate a person's dreams, and were therefore thought to be responsible for the creation of nightmares. Those Elves who were able to construct nightmares were called Mare, and would sneak into a person's home and whisper wicked words into their ears, in an effort to poison their dreams. In other Norse legends by Snorri Sturluson, particularly the Elder Edda, elves are also associated with the Aesir, or the principal gods of the Norse pantheon. There's even a suggestion here that the elves were the principal gods, or that the principal gods often took the form of elves when on earth. Amongst old Scandinavian legend, there existed an idea that elves were a possible cause of illness. In some surviving medical texts, elves are cited as afflicting humans and livestock with disease, including sharp pains, epilepsy, and even mental disorders. The idea was also common in Anglo-Saxon England, where it would continue into the Middle Ages before being widely debated. The idea remained far more prominent in early modern Scotland, where elves would come to resemble powerful people who lived invisibly beside regular people. It is perhaps for this reason that elves were often blamed by those who were accused of witchcraft. Other ideas from this time include elves wielding magical weapons, and that these weapons would have the side effect of compromising a person's immune system, thus making them fall ill. In a few old English medical texts, it was thought that elves inflicted illnesses upon humans deliberately through the use of projectiles, and that the illness would become known as elf shot. In the early days of England, Neolithic arrowheads that were found were often thought to have been made by elves, and that these were the remnants of the cursed projectiles. In some witchcraft trials, it was not uncommon to hear of witches using these arrowheads in elf-related rituals, some of which were conducted with the intention of wounding or infecting people and cattle. There have also been cases of scholars who believe that those who suffered from illnesses such as Williams Syndrome, 
a genetic disorder that causes facial features to appear abnormal, such as a broad forehead, a short nose, and even pointed ears, were caused by elves themselves. Or that elves were inspired by these very people, before there was a scientific diagnosis for them. In more Scandinavian legends, the elf was considered to be a diseased spirit, one who caused afflictions upon those it came in contact with. However, the afflictions were never fatal, and usually consisted of skin rashes, blemishes, and other relatively harmless conditions. One idea has it that in order to heal the condition, one might try to appease the elf by giving him butter in exchange for an antidote. Scandinavian folk at the time were known to take precautions against this particular kind of elf by utilising what was known as elf cores, or the elf cross, which was a cross or a pentagram. These symbols were often painted onto doors or carved into surfaces, as well as onto everyday household items, so as to prevent the elf from stealing them, and to prevent him from even gaining access to the property. The symbols could also be worn on one's person, usually in the form of a silver necklace, which was believed to keep the elves at a safe distance. In the late Middle Ages of Britain, the elf became less of a woodland dwelling creature that sought to either hamper or help someone, but instead a fictional trope in both literature and art. Characters like Puck in William Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream would solidify the elf in a new role within society, not one who caused illnesses or brought healings and blessings, but one of entertainment. As elves became more akin to the likes of fairies, dwarfs and goblins, they became transported from the crevices of the forest and into the pages of books. But in areas of northern England and regions of Scotland, elves were still widely regarded as real-life creatures, and remained this way well into the 19th century. In Norse mythology, however, elves would survive in their female counterparts, mainly in Sweden. Here, elves would come to live in the hills and were thought to be beautiful women that were governed by an elven king. Here, it is once thought that the elven women could be seen dancing on these distant hills, or amongst meadows, though usually at night, or the early hours of the morning. They would leave shapes on the ground from where they had frolicked, and that if one was to urinate in one of these shapes, it would cure sexually transmitted infections and diseases. Often, these were known as elf circles, and in some cases, they could cause bad luck if one was to step on them. Another interesting idea from this legend is that if one was to watch the elves dancing at night, what would have felt like a few hours would actually turn out to be a few years in real time. In many Scandinavian poems, people being lured to dance with the elves was a common theme, a dance that could last an endless number of years without the victim even realising it. Danish ballads that originated in the Middle Ages, meanwhile, also kept elves relevant, though perhaps in a more sexual way. The ballads, many of which can be found in Karen Brashes's Folio, a collection of Danish ballads from the 16th century, detail the saucy encounters between everyday people and the elves. Some of these encounters included mermen, dwarves, and other supernatural entities, but the elves appear to be a particular favourite, perhaps because of their intense beauty or the thrill of danger that they provided. The elves, after all, were thought to be something of temptresses in the way that they lured people into their world, similarly to how the elves of Sweden lured people into their dances, or how the elven queen lured men into her realm in England. In Elfskad, a popular Danish ballad, a female elf seeks to tempt a young knight into dancing with her before inviting him to join her amongst her elven community. In some versions, the knight known as Olav refuses her because he is set to be married the next day. Here he is cursed by the elf and dies the very next day before his wedding. In another version, he accepts her offer, where he also meets his end at the hands of the elf. This tale would come to apply to the average man in Denmark, and in some cases, the gender roles were switched, where it was the woman 
who rejected the male elf, or who were seduced by him. After the medieval period, elves became much less common in England, and were substituted in favour of the likes of dwarves and fairies. But the northern areas and Scotland were far more stubborn in their belief of elves, and this belief continued well into the early modern period, where these tiny creatures were still considered to be invisible beings, and powerful ones too. This belief stretched into Scandinavian territories too, that elves either coexisted amongst humans without us being able to perceive them, or that they lurked in remote areas and lured people away. They continued to be associated with causing men and women illnesses, as well as being threats of the sexual nature, where many tales tell of elves attempting to either seduce or abduct those who were vulnerable. By the time of the industrial age of the 19th century, belief in elves had declined almost unanimously across Europe. Instead, elves found their stage predominantly in literature, as aforementioned, and were immortalised through the works of the literary greats, such as Shakespeare and Tolkien. Puck, in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, would continue the standard for elves as being impish, mischievous creatures that played pranks on humans, but also ones that were fun, loving, and good-humoured. Whilst in previous iterations, elves were considered to be beautiful, but with Puck, he's often portrayed as curious, eccentric, and often bizarre in appearance. Both literature produced in England and Germany appeared to inspire one another when it came to elves, and it was not uncommon for writers to become inspired by the other's work, which had the effect of building the elf with layers upon layers of features, powers, and behaviours. Jacob Grimm, for example, the author of Grimm's Fairy Tales, began to promote the original Elb as opposed to the anglicised Elf, as a result of the increasing popularity of Elves in literature. Danish poet Johan Gottfried Herder translated the Danish ballad Elfskud in the late 18th century, in a collection of folk songs, where he makes mention of the Earl King and his daughter. However, due to a mistranslation in German, the Earl King would become known as the Elf King, giving rise to more plot devices and features about elves and their own communities. Subsequent writers, therefore, would continue the tradition of elves in their works for many years, and it comes as no surprise given how rich the subject had become, courtesy of a collection of legends, folklore, and the many iterations by other writers in Europe. As a result of this, images of elves from the Romantic period of the 1800s onwards depict elves in a variety of different ways, in both mediums of literature and art. In some cases, they were tiny men and women who possessed pointy ears and wore stocking caps. Others had butterfly wings and were able to fly, whilst others were depicted as merely miniature naked people. In Scandinavia, meanwhile, elves would be adapted to include small insect-like wings that allowed them to fly. The idea that elves were beautiful women living in the hills and luring men to their deaths was also adapted into literature, such as The Elfin Hill by Danish author Hans Christian Andersen. Tolkien, on the other hand, who some might say revolutionised the concept of elves and helped shape the way we see them today, are painted very differently from Puck and others, and seem to have been more inspired by the early Anglo-Saxon and Icelandic tales. The elves in Tolkien's world of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit would see elves speaking their own elvish language, and were graceful, wise beings, with sharp senses and possessing a deeper sense of awareness. They were gifted with magic that the humans could not possess, nor understand, and were thought to be skilled archers, with characteristically pointy ears. Tolkien also implemented an idea that elves were immortal, and his vision for these creatures have since gone on to be adapted in various other mediums, where they are often thought to be the standard of what a typical elf looks and behaves like. At this time in the 19th and 20th centuries, some historians took to the idea that elves were in actuality lost indigenous people, 
and that whilst they had possessed no magical ability, the difference of their appearance to the locals gave them something of a supernatural vibe, and so stories of them were exaggerated through generations. These ideas have since been disregarded however, and whilst it is an interesting idea, for the most part, it is generally agreed that elves were merely a superstition made by those who did not possess a better understanding of the world. But in Iceland, belief in elves does actually still hold some weight. There are those that believe elves, known as the hidden people, live in rock formations. Whilst they are not the mystical, disease-inducing, wood-dwelling archers that we've come to expect, they do appear to have a more wholesome agenda. They are thought to disrupt construction work that expands into the wild, and are determined to preserve the natural landscape of the country in spite of urbanisation. It is believed that these elves are the enforcers of the values of our ancestors, and work in the shadows to resist the development of housing expansions that threaten the natural environment. It's clear that with each generation, elves have managed to survive in some capacity. What began in the early Anglo-Saxon age as real-life entities wandering about the forests eventually evolved into a popular literary device, and even a cultural celebration. Whilst folklore has evolved and eroded over time, elves have managed to stay a prominent piece of the puzzle, and continue to entertain, scare, bewilder, and charm us to this very day. Whether they are invisible spirits spewing disease, underground dwellers who fear the sunlight, majestic archers that live forever, or just tiny little men that work in a toy factory, elves will likely be with us forever. Let me know your thoughts of elves in the comments below, and if you've heard of any other stories relating to these colourful bunch of creatures. As always, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to leave it a big thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.